and welcome to Fixing South Sudan, your ideas for building the new nation. I am Adingor. Welcome to Fixing South Sudan, your ideas for building the new nation. I am Adingor. This week on Fixing South Sudan, the new technocratic minister of petroleum shares his vision on how to fix the broken ministry and ultimately the economy of the Republic of South Sudan. Can he fix South Sudan? With us in the program, is Honorable Engineer Awao Daniel Chuang, the newly minted Minister of Petroleum. It's our pleasure to welcome him to Fixing South Sudan for the first time. Sir, welcome to the program. How are you? Thank you. It's a pleasure to have you here. And before we talk about your vision uh, for your ministry, we have to introduce you to the public. Can I ask who is Engineer Awao Daniel Chuang? Yeah, my name is Awood Daniel Chuang. I actually graduated I start from the university. I graduated from the University of Khartoum, uh, Faculty of Engineering and Architecture, uh, Department of Chemical Engineering in 1995. Uh, and then after that, I worked in uh, Pepsi Cola, bottling plant in Khartoum. Uh, and then after that, in 1997, I traveled to Saudi Arabia, where I worked in gold refining company uh, for like one and a half year. That was my first job in Saudi Arabia, in Riyadh, capital of Saudi Arabia. And then from there, I went to Jeddah, where I started to work in a company uh, that was working in, uh, in, in the downstream. Uh, we used to work with Aramco refineries in Jeddah. We used to process uh, vitamin and heavy fuel oils and, and, and the bottoms of the barrel, we call them in oil and gas. Uh, and we extended this work uh, up to uh, 2010. So I worked for like 13 years in different companies in Saudi Arabia. Uh, then from there, I came to Sudan and I joined Sudapet. Uh, I worked also as a project manager in Sudapet. And then from there, I was called to, to South Sudan Municipal Program. In December uh, 2011, after independence. So that's where I started to work in the municipal petroleum, in the capacity of director for refineries and, and pipeline projects. Uh, then, after that, in, nine, in 2015, I was appointed a general of a petroleum authority. Uh, and then, recently, I was appointed as a minister. Before you were appointed minister, you were director general. So you have been the, in the petroleum sector for quite a long time. That's right. And you have inherited this ministry of petroleum. It has its own sets of problems. Where do we begin or where have you begun? Well, I think for us it's not a new thing, it's not a new business. Uh, for me, I can always say that I'm lucky because I'm heading a ministry that I've been part of uh, from 2011 up to now. And most of the challenges that we are facing in the oil and gas industry in South Sudan are quite uh, known to me and my colleagues in the ministry. And that's why uh, I feel always lucky because whatever I'm going to do will not be a new thing at all. And the team that we have also in the municipal petroleum and in the JUCs and the NILPEC also, uh, we, we have also very good uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, knowledge about them because we have been working in some places before. 
and some of them were my colleagues in the university as well, so I know quite a number of them. So whatever I want to do, I think it's, it can be possible because I have a very strong team in the JUCs, in the and in the Ministry of Petroleum. So whatever challenges we are facing at the moment, maybe for others can be a big problem, but for me, I know that we can fix whatever problems we have. The basic concern of the public is that we are an oil producing nation and the money is not coming in the economy. That is part of the problem that you have to solve. Yeah. And the key question we have been asking is, where is the money? Why is the money not coming? Well, you know, the money, I can tell you that is coming, but maybe the way it used to come, probably people don't know. Uh, the result of what we call pre-financing, because we used to sell our group in advance. Okay? The money will come and people will not notice that money has come. And then later, when the crude is sold, you will find yourself that there's no money coming directly after the crude is sold. Not coming to the central bank? Yeah, yeah, directly, because it is given to a company uh, that has paid money in advance. That's where you can see that we have some problems in the sense of crude And that's why the directive that we had from His Excellency the President in my, uh, you know, in my, first, in my appointment, he was giving directives very clear that we need to make sure that all the money comes to the bank. Which means we cannot continue to sell our crude oil in advance. We have to sell our crude oil and then after that we receive the money. Where people can trace and people can know that we are receiving money based on the crude oil that we are, we are selling. In That's your one way. month that you have been here, is there any change to that effect? Yeah, this is the first thing I did actually. And the first thing I did, we sold two cargoes immediately in the free market. And the proceeds of those two cargoes will come to the central bank only for the first time. After we've sold it. People know that there has been an expansion uh, in uh, the oil production, and this continues to be part of the problem that they feel that we are not an oil uh, producing country because they are not seeing any dividends. The money is not trickling into the economy, and you are addressing it. Can you tell us what are the latest figures so that the public knows indeed? we are producing and how much we are producing? Well, in the last uh, two weeks when we sold our first uh, two cargoes after I take office, uh, we are going to expect in, uh, in August and also in September the proceeds of these two cargoes. Of course, we know that there are commitments for projects that will have to be done by the country, like road projects, okay. but all those will have to be you know, managed through our central bank, which means the Minister of Petroleum would not be responsible of allocating a cargo or any crude oil to any party, but we only sell in the free market so that we maximize the value. Because the advantage of selling in the market, in the free market, is that we will not get any deductions. When we sell in the pre-sale market, uh, we'll have to get some deductions, okay? which means the value of our crude will be reduced because the interest rate that has to be factored in. Because somebody who's going to give you money in advance will have to cater for what for the value of the money uh, in advance. And this is what we are stopping now. So selling crude oil today to any company will always give us time to receive the money in full. And this money in full will be more than the money that it was supposed to receive if we sold it in the pre-finance uh, scheme. So the, the, the direction that we have taken now is exactly what the leadership has advised. And the resolution of the Council of Ministers also support the same thing. So we are going to receive the money in the bank, and whoever wants money from South Sudan will have to get it in cash instead of in kind, because in kind causes problems for us and causes value destruction, and it doesn't create any value. But when you sell uh, uh, crude oil in the free market, you get the full value of the crude oil, and then now whatever payments you want to make, you can still make that payment, but they still have money in your central bank, which what? means the inflow and outflow of the mm. money to the central bank will always be maintained. What is the daily production? The daily production. As of now, it's around 178. Because it was 175,000 barrels a day, total from block 3 and 7, and then block 1, 2, and 4. But now we have increased. Because there's a recent field that we have started, uh, and that's a good news also for us, because the field that we've started recently is Manga oil field in block 1, 2, and 4, which was resumed by 100% South Sudanese for the first time. So this, um, this is a good news. Have you reached the pre-oil uh, pre shutdown levels? Or not yet. Not yet, not yet. Exactly. And when do you estimate that you may do so? The pre-oil shutdown, of course, when you talk about pre-oil shutdown, then you have to talk about different fields. 
when we talk about block three and seven, which is currently producing uh, 135,000 barrels a day, uh, we cannot reach the spring shutdown in 2012. If you are talking about 2012. But if you are talking about block 124, then the pre shutdown is in 2013. In 2013, we used to have like 40,000 barrels. But now we are even beyond that. We are even beyond that. We are having now like uh, almost 42,000 barrels a day. And then we are expecting this to continue to increase. By the end of the year, it should be around 50 or maybe 55. Which means the total production from all the fields from South Sudan, the 3 and 7 and 124, will be around 195. Thousand dollars by the end of this year, which means there will be a significant increase compared to last year. We uh, need uh, added by uh, not less than uh, seventy thousand dollars. Your predecessor was talking about an economy that was booming. Is the economy now booming, or will it be booming? The economy is not booming, but the measures that we are taking now will cause it to boom probably at the end, of maybe one and a half year, or maybe two years time, because at the end. We want to make sure that the economy improves as we make sure that the cash flow comes to the bank and the outflow goes, also, uh, goes out to the, to, the, to the market. Because at the end, we need to maintain cash flow in and out. If we don't do that, then of course, that's where we have some problems. Because we want to stabilize the economy by having money in this country. And whatever money we are going to pay, we we'll have to make sure that we have some remnants, remaining money that we can use for other things. Because if you just allocate mm -hmm. uh, for companies to, to, to take, then at the end, nothing will come here in cash, okay? And then the value also will be reduced. And that's why we can see that the economy is going to improve as we continue to maintain the same system that we have started now. This will have some uh, positive impacts on the economy, and I'm sure even the, the, the market will, will stabilize because the rate of exchange will be stabilized because you have money coming and going. But if you don't have money at all coming, then that can be a problem. For you to have achieved the rapid... Uh boost in the production in some of the areas that were previously down. You, had to, uh, uh, you have to involve the expertise of Sudanese, and there is a company called uh, Two Beat. Yeah, what is the involvement of the Sudanese, and is, uh, is there transparency around the production in those areas? Well, you know, the involvement of the Sudanese was only limited to the resumption, the first resumption. And that's why when I said that manga oil field was resumed by South Sudanese, it means that the first one was done by Sudanese. Uh, because for us to, to maintain you know, a supply chain of materials from Sudan, because the, the, the nearest uh, country to the oil field is now is Sudan, whether in Block 3 and 7 or in Block uh, 124. We cannot achieve resumption in Block 124 without the help of Sudanese. That's why Tubioko was instrumental in doing this work, and we did it together uh, through uh, the Minister of Petroleum. And that's why the same team that worked with Tubioko are the ones who have resumed manga oil fields on their own for the first time. And that's, that's, that's something that we have to appreciate. And moving on, we'll see South Sudan is doing the work on their own, especially any work to do with resumption and facilities. I think they are well uh, equipped you know, with experience now that will uh, make things even better. Which means we can even improve our economy by using our workers. Because the pay that they are going to get will not be like an expatriate or any foreign company. Because at the end, they are locals and they can use uh, their talents and their experience with only very minimum cost, which will also increase uh, you know, the profit shares of the government. As we reduce the cost, that of course, uh, the, the profit will, will rise. And as the profit rises, then now we can trap more resources and then this can also add uh, in the value to So would you say that the role of the Sudanese uh, companies has ended or is complementary? It's complementary. It's not ended because they have been doing, working in the same fields for quite some time. And that's why sometimes we have to work as a team with the Sudanese in some fields, in some areas, not everything. Because now in Block 3 we have no Sudanese at all, but Sudan is being run by Sudanese, uh, South Sudanese and, and, and Chinese and Malaysians. Uh, these are the ones who are running it. But in Block 124, which is specific, the challenging for us, uh, that's why we have used Sudanese, and we continue to use them until we are able to, to resolve all the technical challenges in regards, in regards to supply of materials, and also their expertise also in some areas, which we don't have in South Sudan. So we complement each other in doing this work. Minister, let's take a break from you.
Welcome back to Fixing South Sudan, your ideas for building the new nation. I am Adingor, and with us is Honorable Engineer Award Daniel Chuang, the Minister of Petroleum. We are happy to speak about the petroleum industry and the change that has come. And you are saying you are already trying to fix South Sudan, that you are making a difference with the policies that you have implemented so far. Can you fix our Sudan? Are you fixing it? Yes, of course, you know, fixing a country cannot be done through one institution. But what happens is for us to do whatever we can in our capacity as Minister of Petroleum, because we know that petroleum is the backbone of this economy, this country, and that's why probably uh, most of the responsibility is on our shoulders to make sure that we fix the economy of South Sudan. And by fixing the economy, we're fixing South Sudan. Uh, now, People talk about oil being exported through Sudan, and then there are some problems that are coming along with that because you know people think maybe uh, the crude oil can be taken or, or whatever uh, in the process. But I can assure you that the oil processing that happens in Sudan is done in our presence. We have a team of engineers that are positioned in different locations, and if we talk about uh, block three and seven, you find that we have engineers in the Jebelin, which are South Sudanese. They are monitoring the, the processing of the oil in Sudan. And we have also teams uh, that go to Kosti metering station because we have a, an offtake point. An offtake point is where we sell uh, a portion of crude oil to, to Kosti power plant because they are generating power in Sudan using crude oil from South Sudan. So we're selling to them. And we have to make sure that the volumes that are being withdrawn uh, to that plant uh, is also measured by our team. And we have a team that is monitoring that. And when you go to Khartoum as well, Khartoum refinery, they also take a portion crude oil as well. So we have also a team in Khartoum refinery. In essence, we have no interest in, uh, in Khartoum refinery or Coast Park plant. These are facilities that belong to Sudan. But because we are selling our crude oil to those facilities, our presence is important. That's why you can see the level of our presence in, in Sudan in all the pump stations, all up to up to uh, Bashair uh, 1 and Bashair 2, which is the marine terminal where we export our crude oil. So you see that we have a team in South Sudan that is running the production and we know how much we are sending. So obviously, if you know what you are sending, and you know what is being withdrawn, you will understand what should be delivered at the end of the marine terminal. So you can confidently say that there's no more cheating happening, no. either by JOCs or by the Sudanese engineers. You have taken control. Yeah, we are in control of all this, and even sometimes when there are differences in the readings, we always argue, you see? Which means our people they understand very well if anything happens, because sometimes even the reading of the metering can, can go wrong, but it does not mean that somebody is taking it. It can go wrong, and that's why sometimes we have to argue. And we use different measures, uh, methods for us to measure the, the, the volume of the crude oil. And we use, like, you know, uh, dipping. Dipping is a conventional way of measuring at the time when there was no metering at all, because metering is a, is, is a new uh, technology that we use for measuring the flow of oil. But early on, people used to use dipping. So all these measures are being put in place, and our teams are always aware about the volumes that, that are being taken. Even the fuel that is being used for consumption in Sudan, we know it. You see, we know exactly how much the volume is being recorded every day, and we have the figures that are being updated on a daily basis with the team in, in Juba and the teams in Khartoum. And we have also a coordination office uh, in Khartoum that is monitoring all these operations, and, uh, and we know exactly what's happening there, and we know all of this. So we don't see any. Any, any, any big issue. This sometimes we make sure that the meterings are properly functioning and they are being uh, calibrated from time to time to make sure that they don't deviate and they don't give the wrong reading. This brings us to the regulation of the sector and you, what you have said is, is part of that. Uh, but there is concern around environment that some of the companies, they don't respect the environment. And indeed, there's been a lot of uh, spillovers in uh, some of the areas even birth defects. So we are starting to see uh, some changes in the environment. Is this something you are addressing? That's right, because environment for us is key. Uh, knowing that the oil is a depletable resources, and at the end, 
when the oil is finished or is depleted, then eventually we'll have to live in that environment. And for us, our policy now is to live in harmony with oil. We have to create an inclusive environment where people can live in harmony with the oil. And this is something that can be done. And most of the challenges that we're facing in regards to the environment are actually legacy, which means they have started a long time ago since the oil was first discovered in Sudan before independence and up to now. And of course, it's our responsibility to make sure that we clean up the environment. And we have put uh, policies that will regulate uh, the environment, and there are, we have regulations now, and also we also cooperate with the Ministry of Environment and, and, and Water Resources for us to make sure that the resources that are, are, are polluted are mostly water. To address the environmental concerns is part and parcel of what they call the exploration and production sharing agreements. Right. So it's not uh, an isolated case. And does that mean that you have to revisit that? Some of the agreements have been done without uh, consciousness around the environment. That's right. And that's why we have made some amendments okay, and addendums. You are making amendments to the IPSAS. Yes. To the IPSAS to factor in the issues of environment and decommissioning. Is that being done or you are considering it? No, it is already being done. It's already mm -hmm. being done. We have started already since last year, actually. Mm -hmm. So we are going to see in a, this year and maybe next year some money being deposited in an escrow account to cater for the decommissioning. Because at the end, when the oil operation is, 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 you know, is, uh, is depleted, then we have to make sure that all the facilities that will continue to harm the environment are removed and decommissioned. And that's why this thing was not there before. But we have discussed this one already, and it is now signed already, and it's going to be part of the environmental mitigation measures for us to move forward. And then also we are going to recruit an international firm that will run an entire environmental audit. And this environmental audit also will pinpoint areas where we need immediate attention. And then the recommendation from that environmental audit will now give us way, and the funds that will be provided will address all the issues that are related to the environment for us to, to restore that environment. But as of now, no auditing, no environmental uh, auditing has been done. Yeah, but we are going to do it immediately. So what are you doing in the areas that are affected? Or what will you be doing? Because uh, some of these areas, they need uh, some kind of... Uh, you know, special consideration? Well, you know, most of the issues of the environment are related to oil, mostly, mm -hmm. I can tell you. And what we're doing currently is the injection of the water, because most of the water that causes environmental hazard are being re-injected back into the reservoir, which means they will not be on the surface like it used to be. And as of now, we have reached something like almost 40% of the volume of water that's being re-injected back. And we are still developing our re-injection plants so that we can inject all the water that comes to the surface back into the reservoir. Because if they are kept inside the reservoir, we will not have any problem on the surface because uh, it is water that most causes most of the problem. Lucky enough, we don't have gases that cause environmental hazard from our oil because our oil doesn't contain hazardous gases like you know carbon dioxide, I mean uh, sulfur dioxide or nitrogen oxide. We don't have those and we are lucky. And most of the problems are actually from water that come from the from the reservoir, we could produce water. Whatever it is, it is affecting the local That's populations. Right. And how are you elevating their situation? There's we supposed have, to be money for them. We have, we have now plans already, even to relocate some of the villages that are very close to the water that can cause problems, even livestock. And most of the incident that we have over the years was actually for livestock and maybe cases of, you know, of deformed uh, children or something. This is what we used to have. And as of now, we're making investigation on this. And uh, the environmental audit actually will address all those issues, even including a social impact. Because at the end, we have to relocate people temporarily from their uh, places where uh, they can be affected, and then later, so that we, we, we are able to, to solve all the problems of water. We have to drain the water and then realize zero, zero discharge in about three years from now. It used to be uh, 2015 that we talk about this, but there was no action taken. But from now, we are going to see something like three years for us to have a zero discharge. Zero discharge means you can live just near the well without any problem. Mm -hmm. Zero discharge is the environment. This is our policy now. Even flaring of the gas, uh, we are going to address it because gas... You are going to use technology. Yeah, we are going to use technology. That is going to minimize, to minimize the damage. The, the damage of the environment and then people can live in harmony uh, with oil in the next uh, three years. We speak of South Sudan as an independent country and yet we are not in full control of our resources. And we have Nile Pet. Um, that is state-owned and is supposed to build its capacity over time so that it takes over even the production uh, of the blocks. And that has not happened. What is your plan for Nile Pet? 
Well, of course, an iPad has to be empowered, and we need to make sure that they have the right setup, because usually any problem is from the setup. So when it is restructured in a way that will allow it work, and then that will even allow the government to support for them to, 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 to run like a government, like a company, uh, this is very important. This is the role that we have to take. The focus. current setup is that it is under the presidency. Is that going to change? It doesn't matter whether it is under the presidency or the minister, but this, the, 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 the structure of the company itself is very important for us to fix. Once you set the structure properly, then now you'll allow people to work and then they will generate money because it's supposed to run like a company. It should be a parastatal, yes. standing on its own feet. That's right. And part of what affects NILPAD is this political interference and even the appointments. Uh, some of the people who are abroad may not have the technical expertise. That's is right. it something you are arguing That's right. to the cabinet that this has to change and NILPAD has to be profitable? That's right. Because over time, the money is divided, and that is not how a company should be run. Well, the structure that we're talking about actually is for us to put the right structures, and then also to make sure that NILPAD is not overwhelmed with responsibilities, because when they are specialized, they're supposed to be focusing on the other stream, which is exploration and production. Exploration and production is the core business of NILPAD, and that's why we think that if we focus on upstream stream, and then we reduce the number of people who work there, and then we select the right candidates, and then put also criteria for selection, this will also stop people being employed without uh, the proper you know, uh, qualification. Because at the end, if you don't get the right people that can do the work, uh, they will not benefit. They will not even produce any, any results. And that's why it is very important. And these are all actually to work to make sure that that is, is, is restructured, and then criteria are put, and measures are put for them to, to work as a company, as a government policy that produces money and generates money to the government. And then also they produce also cutters that will work and take over the oil industry. You spoke about uh, uh, highly about your engineers. Do you have enough of them, or is this part of your program that you are going to train uh, South Sudanese so that they can take over the industry? Well, we don't have enough. We have engineers that are very good, they're well qualified in the areas, but still we are even lacking some specializations, yeah. which means we need to bridge those gaps. But if we don't put the right structures. You will not even know what they are, they are lacking. When you put the right instruction, then you know what's missing. You see? But as of now, we have a good number of engineers, but they are not enough. And they will never be enough even in the next 10 years. And that's why the proper way of doing this is for us to train a good number of South Sudanese engineers and geologists and even uh, you know, uh, petroleum uh, you know, economies. This is very important because you know, petroleum is a vast industry that has to, uh, to take people from different backgrounds, even legal legal people, so you have to train them on petroleum laws so that they are able to, uh, to, to, to manage this industry uh, with all these aspects. And this is very important. This is key for us. And that's the reason we are trying also to work uh, with our partners uh, to train our people. And also on our own, we need to have our own resources because we cannot rely 100% on our partners. Can you make a linkage with the institutions that exist because the manpower that is being trained in South Sudan has to be useful to the country. That's right, that's right. This is very important for us. And we are also thinking of having an international training center of our own. Because sometimes, if you want to train a good number of people, it's better that you do them at home. At home. Because if you send them abroad, you may have a lot of you know, financial education that you may, you may not be able to have at the time. But if you build uh, this, uh, institute, uh, this training center in South Sudan, you can also bring uh, trainers to South Sudan so that you can train as much as you can in the country, including the university students that are looking for business uh, and, uh, in, the, in, the, in the work uh, market. The service industry uh, makes a lot of uh, millions of dollars, but is heavily dominated by foreign uh, companies. Uh, what is your plan to empower the locals so that they can have a, a fair share of, of the industry? Yeah, the first uh, um, the statement order that I made was on that issue. And then the team is working now to identify exactly the weaknesses of our local companies and also the shares that we are supposed to have as local. Because we have also developed a local content policy and I'm going to sign off this next week. Uh, this local content policy will empower our local indigenous uh, companies so that they have a fair share. Because when you talk about cost oil, cost oil uh, should always, you know, we should be always part of and parcel of that because when we are able to get some portion of the cost oil, which means our profit oil also will, will, will increase, and this will also uh, help in uh, you know improving our economy. As the local companies get employment, uh, get get contracts, 
then this money will remain in this country. It's not like you know, like foreign companies that would always uh, take their uh, money outside the country. And that's why the local company is very important. We are working on that. It's one of the priorities. Jobs are important for the young people. And this is something you think can also be addressed. That's right. And then by creating opportunities for the local company, then you are opening, you are creating jobs. And at the same time, you are also creating jobs through the current uh, operating companies as well. And that's why also we have two teams that are working concurrently. One is working on the local content, and then the other one is working on the local uh, employment. And this is the plan that we are going to have for us to open up and have more uh, jobs created in the oil industry, and then also to make sure that we retain this, you know, an enough, a sizable amount of money from the port oil into our local economy. And this also will have a very positive contribution to our economy. When you open up for jobs, will it be the right person in the right place or the nepotistic tendencies that tend to exist? A lot of complaints about this. When that is about knowing a big person in the government that lends you a job at DAR or any of the JOCs. Well, you know, this one will be on a competitive basis. Because at the end, we'll make sure that our local people are employed on an equal basis and they'll have to compete. Because nobody will be posted because of, uh, you know, you know somebody. Unless he is qualified, okay? He can be only recommended for him to go and compete, but not uh, posted just for employment purposes without any proper qualification. And this is what we are doing now. We are trying to see uh, those who cannot deliver in their positions. And those who can deliver, also we have to know them, so that we are able to put them in the right places where they can have impact and they can be productive. By doing so, then of course, we see results. Results will be there, because if you minimize uh, you know, using foreigners, then now you are able to, to improve your economy, because the money that will be received by our locals will now contribute to our local economy as well. And we have to put the right people in. Especially in the oil and gas industry, is a knowledge-intensive uh, industry. Anyone who has no proper knowledge, may not fit uh, uh, in that industry. And that's why we have to see people with their capabilities and put them in the right places. We are not going to, 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 to chase them away or do whatever, but we have to put them where they can rightly fit and at least where they can develop their career. And uh, there will be people who can be more beneficial to themselves and the country and the economy. You have said a lot, but are you going to live up to those promises? Will well, you honor them? Well, when I'm all sure. is said and done. I'm sure what I'm doing what I'm saying is what I'm going to do. Trust me. You're going to fix South Sudan. Or is South Sudan going to fix you down the road? No. I and you will change and turn back on these promises? Well, I will not turn back on these promises. And uh, you'll see that. Because usually what we say, I myself, what I say is what I will do. And if I know that I cannot do it, I will not even say it at all. Thank you for coming to Fixing South Sudan.